afternoon and welcome to the Royal College of Pathologists Guideline Implementation Webinar Program. My name is Peter Johnston. I'm the College Vice President for Professionalism and it's a great pleasure this afternoon to be welcoming you to uh, a webinar on the histopathological reporting of tumours of the urinary collecting system. We've got a panel of experts who have written the guidelines with us today, and I'm pleased to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Morali Varma, who's beaming in all the way from New York, and co-authors Ash Chandra and Dr. Jonathan Shanks. The um, programme will last about 15 minutes, and then we'll have 20 minutes questions thereafter. Um, just point out to you that the questions, please ask them on the Q&A. You will be muted, and the questions will come through me the chat session is, is closed, so use the Q&A for, for all questions. So without any further ado, I would just like to pass over to Murali, who will uh, lead on the, the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Okay, this, uh, this data set is version number three of the data set published in August 2021. It's basically building on the previous data set in, 20, in 2013, with, uh, which was lead authored by Jonathan Shanks. Uh, as in the previous data set, we have separate uh, set of core and non-core data items for biopsies and QRBT specimens on one side and resection specimens on the other. What I will discuss today are uh, briefly the main changes in the third edition. And then I will try to put this into a more clinical context. So the clinical utility of these uh, data items and how understanding the clinical utility can, uh, can affect and make our practice easier. And finally, a few practice points about using the data set. So what are the changes in the third edition? We updated it based on, on the WHO 2016 classification. I think one of the main changes was we, uh, the staging of uh, TURBT specimens We've, we have changed our recommendations. And then finally, some recommendations on bio, biomarker testing. So with QRBT staging, the question is to pee or not to pee. So when you put a stage category, a T, the T category, should it be a clinical stage or category, a CT or a pathological stage, PT? Now, the TNM rules state that P means post-treatment and QRBT is not treatment. So uh, the PT stage should be assigned only if the higher stage can be excluded, which means you can only assign it in essentially in cystectomy specimens with very rare uh, exceptions. Now clinic, for clinicians, it probably doesn't matter in clinical practice, whether you, you put it as PT1 or you put it as T1, the clinicians understand what you're talking about. The issue can be for cancer registry personnel who are generally recommended to use the, the pathological stage in the pathology report. And they should, just because the, the path report says PT1, they should not stage the patient as PT1. The, the patient would be T1. So for that reason, we recommend in the current data set not to use P uh, in TRBT staging. Biomarker testing, uh, PDL1 testing, PDL1 uh, predicts the response to checkpoint inhibitors. The problem here is that there are a number of different anti PDL1 clones from different manufacturers, and each clone is linked to a specific uh, immunotherapy agent. And each of these clones are tested using different algorithms and different cutoffs. So which makes it extremely complex, the testing system. The other problem is that all patients with advanced bladder cancer don't require PDL1 testing because they don't, uh, immunotherapy is suitable, is if you're, you, it's only the, if it's used for first line, for second line therapy, where the patient has failed cisplatin therapy, they don't need PDL1 testing. So not all patients need PDL1 testing. So if we do routinely PDL1 testing on all cases, we would be wasting a lot of resources. So for these reasons, we recommend that routine testing is not recommended and that, that this should be test, the test should be using, uh, done using an appropriate assay based on an oncologist request, preferably 
through an MDT meeting. The next biomarker issue is with the upper tract TCCs, whether we should be doing MMR, uh, mismatch repair, or MSI testing. About a small proportion of upper tract urinary cancers, about one to 3% are associated with Lynch syndrome. So the question comes, should we then routinely test for Lynch syndrome in upper tract uh, uh, TCCs? The European Association of Urology recommends DNA testing for patients at higher risk of Lynch syndrome, and there is insufficient evidence to recommend routine MMR or MSI testing of upper tract uh, urinary cancer. So for that reason, we do not recommend routine testing only for specifically if required at the advice of the MDT. There are a number of uh, prognostic biomarkers, immunohistochemical and molecular out there for prediction of uh, recurrence and progression risk in patient with TA and T1 bladder cancer. However, their clinical utility remains to be validated. And again, we do not recommend their general use. Moving on to the clinical utility of the PATH data. So we, uh, as you can see, there are, there are a number of core and non-core data items. Now, how are these actually used in clinical practice? So the, the main clinical guidelines in Europe are by the European Association of Urology, and they have two separate guidelines, one for non-muscle invasive and the other for muscle invasive. When urologists talk about muscle, they're talking about detrusor muscle. They don't recognize muscularis mucosae. So non-muscle invasive means it's TA or T1, and muscle invasive is T2 and above. Now for muscle invasive bladder cancer, the treatment is, is radical therapy, cystectomy or radiotherapy. And in this situation, there's actually a very limited role for histopathology data. So the pathologist's role here is to confirm the diagnosis of urothelial carcinoma, that it's not a malignant paraganglioma or it's not um, a, a lymphoma or something else. And then is there a small cell carcinoma component? Because if there's any small cell carcinoma component, the patient would receive small cell chemotherapy. The, uh, it is important, obviously, to confirm the stage uh, that it is T2. And if there is a biopsy from a lymph node or uh, elsewhere, uh, that is the N stage and the M stage. And then finally, these days, pdl one status is becoming more relevant in muscle invasive bladder cancer, but it's still very limited. In contrast to that, in non-muscle invasive tumors, so that's TA, TIS, and uh, T1, the, the, the treatment options are more wide. There's a, the patients can, under, can be managed with, simply with surveillance, intravesical mitomycin, BCG, and cystectomy. Uh, these are increasing levels of, of treatment. And in this situation, the pathologist plays a critical role because pathology data forms a major part of risk stratification. And there are several parameters used. So it's not based purely on pathology, but pathology is a critical bit. So here is a, the latest EAU uh, strat risk stratification table for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Patients are divided into low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, and a very high risk group with different management uh, uh, protocols recommended for each of these groups. Now you can see that this stratification is based on pathologic features like tumor grade, the TRBT uh, T category, and the presence or absence of CIS. But in addition to that, there are other risk factors such as the age of the patient, the number of tumors, and the size of the tumors. So these are clinical factors. So one point I would like to emphasize over here is that CIS is critical. Identification of, of urothelial carcinoma in situ is absolutely critical because once the patient has CIS, irrespective of what else, uh, uh, whatever the clinical factors are or anything else, he's automatically in the high-risk group and he would be recommended BCG therapy with all its morbidity. So CIS is something that you should diagnose with care. The other critical pathology data in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is um, uh, CIS in the prostatic urethra, bad variant histology, and LVSI, because these are by definition very high risk. 
and, con and consideration for cystectomy for TA and T1 disease. So again, these are things that you would, uh, uh, you have to be certain before you diagnose this because uh, the patient may end up with a cystectomy. So again, the risk stratification has changed. So in, uh, in 2020, all G3 tumors were high risk. So in that situation, identification of focal T1 was not critical. So whether it is G3 TA or G3 T1, the treatment would be identical. But today it's different. In the latest guidelines, uh, it, G3 TA with only one risk factor is intermediate risk. So identification of focal T1 in G3 can be critical. So it's a moving target. So some practice points, when it comes to grading, we have the two grading systems, the 1973 and the 2004. And in many countries, the 2004 is the only grading system used. Uh, the problem here is that in the 1973 system, the, the middle category, the grade two category is wide and heterogeneous. In 2004 system, the high grade category is wide and heterogeneous. So both of these systems have serious pitfalls. So here, this is what the latest EAU says. The 1973 is a, is a better prognosticator than the 2004, but however, a four-tier system using both uh, 73 and 2004 together uh, is superior to either classification alone because it provides a better stratification of the patients. So as in the previous guidelines, we recommend in the UK, unlike the practice in North America, Australia, India, et cetera, where they report only uh, the WHO 2004 as low grade or high grade, we recommend reporting it in parallel so that the, the G2 category is divided into low grade G2 and high grade G2, and the high grade category is divided into G2 high grade and G3 high grade. And that the subtypes of urothelial carcinoma like nested, et cetera, should not be graded. When you get mixed morphological patterns, if there is any urothelial differentiation, including in C2, so if you've got a 99% squamous with 1% urothelial, this would be categorized as a urothelial carcinoma with extensive squamous differentiation. So it's important to identify any urothelial component. The only exception to this rule is small cell component. Any small cell, so if you've got a 99% urothelial cancer with 1% small cell, it would be categorized as a small cell carcinoma. Report the approximate percentage of components. This, the problem with these percentage of the various components is that there are no agreed cutoffs for management. And this is currently not part of the management algorithms. So this is not really used by clinicians. What they're trying to know is whether this is predominantly, like most of it is 99% squamous with 1% urothelial, or is it 1% squamous with 99% urothelial. You're looking at that sort of differences. And then you got the substaging for, of, on TRBT specimens of T1 disease, which can be done anatomically based on the relationship to the muscularis mucosae, how deep the tumor is going, whether it's going beyond the muscularis mucosae or not. So that's T1A and T1B or in millimeter depth of invasion. This, these are, both of these are difficult to assess because of the muscularis propria layer, mucosa layer is uh, incomplete. So you may not have it in your plane of section and tangential sectioning can overestimate the depth of invasion. And again, this is not a part of any risk stratification models and is currently not used by clinicians automatically. So we recommend using it as a uh, uh, reporting it, but it's a non-core data item and you don't need either of these, just reporting as focal, extensive, superficial, deep. So something like uh, focal limited to the stromal cores or extensive abutting the dead to the muscle, that is sufficient. Finally, just a few points on cystectomy reporting. The uretric and urethral margin examination, which is commonly done by pathologists, it has very limited clinical utility. If you have invasive tumor at the margin, these patients don't come back with local recurrence. They come back with distant metastasis. And CIS at the margin is not really that reliable because CIS is a field change, it's a discontinuous. So just because a random plane, which is the plane of resection is negative, 
does not mean that the patient uh, that the patient doesn't have CIS in the urethra that is left behind. So you get these skipped lesions, which would result in false negative frozen sections. So we would strongly discourage the use of routine frozen sections of urethric or urethral margins. When it comes to cystoprostatectomy sampling, it is common for in many institutions to all embed the prostate in cystoprostatectomy specimens. Now, in my opinion, uh, this is inappropriate because this, the cystoprostatectomy has been done to man as part of the management of bladder cancer. So the focus should be on staging bladder cancer rather than trying to detect incidental prostate can uh, cancer. So that the latter, detecting incidental prostate cancer is screening. That is not the role of the pathologist in cystoprostatectomy specimens. We don't all embed the uterus that comes in a cystectomy specimen in a woman in case that she's got endometrial cancer. So the same way, there's no need to all embed the prostate. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I will now stop sharing. Murali, thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> what, what a tour. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting just listening to that, that, that. Everybody always complains about lymphoma diagnosis and the complexity of that. That does seem to be quite a complicated um, way of, of defining these lesions, and it, it's not getting any simpler by the looks of it. Um, I just pick up a couple of themes of questions that have come through, first of all. I'll go with a simple one, first of all. So there was a question about um, percentages. You mentioned in, in the course of your talk, um, for example, 1% squamous and 99%, no, 1% urethelial, 99% squamous was going to be a urethelial carcinoma. The, the question was around, should we be reporting percentages of variance in TURBT specimens? Yeah, I think that is a very good question. And I think the, the general recommend, the international recommendation is that you should report the percentage, but you don't have to fuss about it. It's simply reporting an approximate. The reason why it is useful is if you've got a tumor that is predominantly, uh, that is 99% you know, squamous with 1% urothelial, it's quite likely that the metastasis, if the patient does present with metastasis later, might be purely squamous. And there's also a suggestion that these tumors may not respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy the way uh, urothelial carcinomas would. So yes, do report it, but it's a very rough percentage to the nearest 10%. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Just on a it's sort of related uh, topic is, you mentioned also about the, the lack of necessity to do to, to embed a whole prostate in a cystoprostatectomy specimen. The question was, if you do detect prostatic cancer in that specimen, would you then go back and block the whole case, the whole, the whole prostate as you would normally? My instinct would be you do, but um, I'd be interested to hear it from an expert. Yeah, I think it's very variable. So again, it all depends. So what I do in my own practice, there's, there's huge variation among the experts with this, okay? So some experts would go back and all embed the prostate, which saying that that's the easiest way to do it. Let me just make one point, I think, which you know everyone needs to understand that even when you all embed the prostate gland, you have only examined 0.15% of the prostate under the microscope. So the sampling error of the biopsy tech, uh, the uh, you know of histopathology is massive. You only examine one five micron section of a three millimeter tumor. So let's not fool ourselves by thinking that we have examined all of the prostate and that we are going to pick up every single prostate cancer in there. So we won't. So what? Uh, so uh, what do I do in my practice? I do ink the the cystoprostatectomy specimen, the right and left, with different colors. I might go back and put a more, few more blocks from that side. It also depends on what I'm finding. If I'm finding a small one millimeter, three plus three tumor, I wouldn't bother to go back and put more. If I find a higher grade tumor, where I think there is a risk that this is going to be a more aggressive prostate cancer, I would go back and put. Ash might have something to add to this because I think they had done a survey, sorry, not a survey, but an audit of their uh, cystoprostatectomy specimens because that guys, they all embed the, the prostate and I think the clinical utility was limited. Isn't that right, Ash? And that's absolutely true, Murli. Thank you very much. So we did find that in 50% uh, of the uh, prostates in cystoprostatectomy specimens had 
uh, you know, variable stages and grades of uh, prostatic acinar adenocarcinoma, and that even the presence of uh, positive margins or lymphovascular invasion uh, or the Gleason score did not really alter the long-term prognosis of these patients. Bladder cancer almost always trumps prostate cancer regardless of its grade and stage. So really chasing prostate cancer and tr trying to define its uh, limits and its extent in a cystoprostatectomy specimen isn't worth doing. The reason why we embed all of the prostate, again, is to be able to come up with information like that, so it has got some research value there, uh, but also because we embed our cystoprostatectomy specimens as mega blocks, it's very easy in an average size prostate to just, you know, embed it all in four blocks and then maybe another four mega blocks of uh, the posterior wall of the bladder and you know three or four blocks for the anterior and in about you know 10 blocks you have basically got the whole case and it becomes uh, very easy to to sort of report it you know so uh, it really cuts down on the reporting time as well if you're using mega blocks but you know there are times when you have a really big prostate attached to the specimen and there i think the important thing is of course to take a section from the apex but also uh, the section that is closest to the bladder neck is probably the most important one because if there is any contiguous spread from the bladder neck into the prostate or into the seminal vesicles, uh, that will alter the stage in a meaningful way. So that would be the important site to uh, definitely uh, block the prostate from. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Murali. Yeah, I think uh, just add a couple of things to this. I think it's important as pathologists that we focus on the clinical question. We are not stamp collectors, okay? We don't just collect pretty data. We collect data because it's clinically relevant. So you have, so when you're looking at a cystectomy specimen, consider what the clinical question is. So if you've got a tumor, uh, the QRBT tumor was at the dome of the bladder, then you don't need a lot of sampling of the base of the bladder to see whether there's contiguous spread to the prostate because a tumor in the dome of the bladder cannot spread to the prostate, which is at the base of the bladder. But if the tumor was at the base of the bladder and the QRBT specimen, you should block the base of the bladder so that you get the, uh, to know whether there's direct involvement of the, of the gland. The other point is, see the, the idea of us, this idea of perfection that we want to pick up every single bladder cancer or every single prostate cancer. When I go to the GP, the GP does not examine my reflexes. If, my, if a GP were to do my uh, full neurological examination of every single patient who comes through his door, he will pick up life, he will save lives. There's no doubt about it, but it's not cost effective. And I think as pathologists, we also have to focus on what is cost effective. Uh, so it has to be useful and it has to be cost effective. I think for I think for um, subtyping some of the more poorly differentiated carcinomas, it will be an approximation of the relative percentages also. So, for example, just to illustrate that point, uh, we do a lot of penile work here. We see some tumors of the distal urethra, penile urethra. Uh, we have seen cases reported as high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Uh, the patients then investigated. Uh, and found to have nothing in the bladder. But those cases actually turn out to be basaloid squamous carcinomas with papillary architecture. So I think once tumors become poorly diff, there are some gray areas with regards to subclassification and uh, you know relative percentages of, uh, of subtypes and differentiation. Uh, that's right, uh, Jodi, you're absolutely right. I think uh, you, the problem with urothelial carcinoma is that poorly differentiated urothelial carcinoma does not have a specific morphology. It's a very nondescript morphology. And so distinguishing poly differentiated urothelial from poly differentiated squamous is practically impossible either by morphology or by immuno. So we only diagnose uh, squamous uh, differentiation in a urothelial carcinoma when we see either ke keratinization, with exactly. keratin pearls or obvious keratinization or in, uh, intercellular bridges. But most of the time you're looking for keratinization. Yeah, I wanted to illustrate with an extreme example of the this. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think also this is probably a good opportunity to uh, mention the difference between differentiation and variance. And uh, so, you know, or, or other histological types, you know, so the difference between the, because you've got any small cell carcinoma component in a urothelial 
you know, a, a mixed urothelial carcinoma, then that again becomes a diagnosis. And you know, it becomes a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma with urothelial differentiation. Uh, and because that patient would be given for small cell carcinoma and then may go on to have a cystectomy at a later stage where you may not find any small cell um, carcinoma component because that will be in a treated way. So that's also something to bear in mind. Murli. Yeah, I think we've had a couple of cases where I've seen where there's very little uh, small cell component in the TURBT specimen. And they gave new adjuvant chemotherapy, the you know, urothelial carcinoma type new adjuvant chemotherapy and the cystectomy specimen, it was predominantly small cell. So there was a, so the, so even when you get a small amount of, of small cell in a TRBT specimen, be very, very careful because the patient might actually have a lot of small cell in, in there. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's a number of questions come in. I'd like to go back to stuff that actually came in at the beginning, which I think is, is important. Um, during the course of the talk, Murali, you spoke about the importance of diagnosing carcinoma in situ. And there's a couple of questions round about that. Um, first of all, are, are there any changes in the criteria for diagnosing um, CIS? And, and the relevance of that really is um, about its presence or absence in adjacent pieces of tissue to already invasive cancer. So is it sitting on top of the invasive cancer and therefore do we ignore it or do we not? And the second point is about um, really should be doing this on a TURBT, given the fact we don't really know that orientation. So it's just the, 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 the given the yeah, relevance of, yeah. of CIS to where right. we are with these cancers, um, how do we realistically and, and carefully get the right answer from, from the material we receive? I think these are excellent questions because they are very good questions because these are things where, uh, you know, it's a real struggle. It, on sometimes in the publications, it makes it look black and white. It's nothing of the sort. So when I talk about, when, when it comes to CIS, essentially there are three different types, diff, three variants of CIS, if you want three types cl of clinical settings. So if I show it with my finger, if that's a papillary tumor, you could have CIS at the edge of the tumor. You got a papillary tumor and you got the, so this is what we call a shoulder of the, of a pap. So is it just a shoulder of the papillary tumor or is it CIS in the adjacent urothelium? Or you could have CIS separate in the, in the bladder elsewhere. So if you get a biopsy from elsewhere in the bladder, so you get the TURBT and a separate biopsy which shows CIS, that's very easy to say that is CIS and that's a totally separate. And those are the patients who do worst. The other, the, the reason why CIS is so important is the papillary tumor can be seen on the cystoscopy and the surgeon can do a complete TURBT. He can do a complete resection. The, the urologist cannot reliably identify CIS on the cystoscopy, so he cannot remove all of it. So once a patient has CIS, the recurrence rate is higher because all of it has not been resected. So how do we report it? So if you've got a papillary tumor and you've got some flat epithelium adjacent to it, which is morphologically the same as a papillary tumor, then do not call it CIS. You call it CIS only if it is separate. So it is spatially separate or it is morphologically different. Now, I agree that this is not all wonderfully scientific because it all depends on the plane of section. So something that looks spatially separate in your plane of section may be continuous in a different plane of section with deeper levels or in a plane of section which you don't have. But these are the rules that we use pragmatically to identify CIS. But you should diagnose CIS in, the, in a TURBT specimen when it's only absolutely clear cut. So if you've got a doubt that this is just the shoulder of the, of the papillary tumor at the edge of the papillary tumor or overlying a papillary, or, or the papillary tumor, if it's got an inverted growth pattern, do not call it CIS. Thank you, that's very helpful. There's another series of questions we've got in about grading. So do we think that um, a grading is relevant in a way? Because a lot of clinicians will say, well, it's high grade or low grade. Does it matter if it's you know, grade two high or grade three, what, what's the difference? And that, that, that is also backed up by questions about what are the criteria for making these diagnoses and are they, sufficiently robust or too subjective? 
So right. those are the sorts of things. And, and again, on a similar note, how often do we diagnose the, the pun lump category? And do we usually end up calling them grade one, low grade TA? So what, what, what's the deal and where's the relevance? I noticed you mentioned it in the, in the talk, um, uh, that category. So it's just, as I say, there's, there's a general concern about this grading yep. and our accuracy and consistency of doing that. Okay, so let me start. Let me get rid of the punlam one. That's the easy one to get rid of. Don't worry about punlam at all. Punlam doesn't matter. It is an it is an artificial creation. The clinicians will manage punlam exactly like low grade. So whether you call it punlam or you call it G one low grade, it makes no difference. So uh, the only time I really diagnose punlam is if in a very young patient. I'm really reluctant to label this patient with a bladder cancer diagnosis. Uh, so uh, Punlump is a pretty rare diagnosis. And I suspect in future, I know it's going to, it's probably going to survive uh, the late, the next edition of WHO, but I know a lot of experts are against it and would like to get rid of it. The other question is, is more tricky about the grade. I think here, uh, I think as pathologists, we are worrying too much about precision. Because what you got here is a continuum between low grade and high grade. We have drawn an artificial cutoff. So when we create these criteria for distinguishing low grade from high grade or criteria for G2 versus G3, that is only for reproducibility. There is no line there. There is no quantum change in uh, progression risk between a G2 and a G3 or a low grade and a high grade. It's a continuum. A bad G2 tumor will behave exactly the same as a good G3 tumor. Uh, a tumor at the bad end of G2 and good end of G3 will behave the same. Bad end of low grade, sorry, bad end of high grade and uh, the bad end of low, low grade and good end of high grade will also behave the same. So this is like PSA. A PSA of 19.9 and 20.1 will not behave differently. They're treated, uh, so it's only an artificial cutoff. But the important thing is to communicate this to the patient. So the problem we have is, if we just report it as high grade, this could be a tumor that on another day, I would have called it low grade. There is, we know their subjectivity in diagnosis. One day I would call it low grade, one day I would call it high grade. You show it to two experts, one expert will show it, call it low grade, and our other expert would call it high grade. Or this tumor could be at the other end of the spectrum, which is a most unequivocal G3 high grade tumor that you've ever seen. But the report will only say high grade. And there is no way for the urologist or the clinician to know where it is in the spectrum. The, finally, this is about patient management. And the biggest lack of, uh, of reproduce, reproducibility or the greatest variability is not on the part of the, of the pathologist or the urologist, but on the part of the patient. You present the two patients with identical, you tell them you got a 3% risk of a progression. One patient will want BCG therapy, the other patient will not want BCG therapy, right? So, so the key thing, this is not about getting it exactly right, whether it is a G2 or a G3, or whether it's a low grade or a high grade. It's about communicating to the clinician where the patient is in the grading spectrum so that the clinician can then communicate that to the patient who can then make an informed decision. Thank you. I've got some questions about risk and post-operative treatment coming, but there's one that I'd like to just put out there for you to think about just now, and we'll come back to later because we've got a lot of practical questions, and this one's more, um, more in terms of etiological thinking. The question is, why do um, bladder cancer patients have high incidences of prostate cancer. So I'll leave that one floating just now and let you think about that while we come back to looking at some more practical things. And so in terms of follow-up and management, you mentioned um, the grading, um, the staging of prostate, uh, of uh, TURBTs at, at some, at, in some depth. And you mentioned the fact that the, the little p that we've often used should be reserved only for post-treatment. So you really saying we should only use that in post-cystectomy or in cystectomy specimens or that, that or equivalent? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, the, the TNM rule is that you can only use a P if you can exclude the higher one. So you can call someone, uh, you can categorize as PT1 if you can confidently exclude PT2. Uh, 
which you can't do in a QRBT. The only exception to that is where you get an end block resection. So like, like a colonic polyp, if they take out the whole thing as one single piece, which you can then section and examine the margins, and you can say there's definitely no T2, in that situation, you can call it PT1, but that's a vanishingly rare situation. We discussed this rule. We discussed this rule at some length when preparing the previous data set. And uh, as Murley said, um, the use of pathological stage entails that you can assess and see the deepest point of invasion of the tumor, and the tumor has been completely removed, which is not the case for a TURBT. Uh, we did discuss at some length um removing the the p for biopsy and tur but it was decided i think on a popular vote to retain it so what we ended up doing is retaining it but putting a very large disclaimer for anyone who has the previous data set saying this is not recommended but it was retained on a popular decision a popular vote decision so i'm i'm pleased to see it's now being corrected in the current data set yeah, we did, uh, as I think Jonathan, even in, in, the, in the previous version, we had contacted the TNM help desk and the TNM, uh, uh, the official TNM recommendation was not to use the P in QRBT specimens. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another, a couple of other things just about a, the, 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 the staging process and its, its um, relevance. Question about urethral involvement and what, what is the, significance of urethral involvement to what happens to patients next terms of things like reconstructive surgery and so on? Again, yeah. uh, that's a very good question. Uh, now, prostatic urethral involvement is important for two reasons. The first, once you've got prostatic urethral involvement uh, from the prostatic urethra, the, C the CIS can go into the prostatic ducts. So once you get CIS in the prostatic urethra and then it goes into the prostatic ducts, uh, involves the, prost uh, the prostate glands, BCG will not be effective. And that's the reason why uh, patients often end up, uh, they're recommended a cystectomy once you've got prostatic urethral involvement. In a cystectomy specimen, prostatic urethral involvement is important to document because if the patient has had a re had reconstruction, he, he would re reconstruction surgery would not be appropriate. And if he's had reconstruction surgery, they would have to either reverse it. More commonly, because it's very difficult to reverse it, you're talking about very close follow up because the, the patient is at very high risk of recurrence. I don't know if the question actually also wanted was also functions. Um, on urethral margins, I saw something, um, you know, alluding to to that in the in the Q and A. As, the, uh, as far uh, as the margins are concerned, uh, you know, both the urethral margins and the urethric margins, assessing them for CIS is in, is not really scientific, because CIS is not a continuous process. Because it's a discontinuous process, just because you got one line uh, where the, the scalpel has gone through, which is negative for CIS, doesn't mean that there is no uh, residual CIS in the patient. In our institution, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say in our institution, it, it is on a case basis and the choice of the reconstructive type of uh, surgery for the patient. So the ones who are going to have uh, neobladder uh, type of reconstruction, uh, they will usually request a frozen section because they want to be sure at least at the point where they're, uh, you know, plumbing in the, you, uh, uh, you know, is free of CIS so that they're at least able to say to the patient when they wake up, you know, at the point that of the urethra yeah, so there was that, no CIS. Yeah, so for, right. so, so for, I think so that, that is more for, of a for, soft one, isn't it? It's not really a scientific approach because it's not scientific no. because CIS, just because that, that line doesn't have CIS. Oh, sure, sure. The, sure, the no, patient's absolutely. chance of rec, it's very important to recognize any CIS in the urethra, isn't it? Because if you get any CIS right. in the urethra, the patient's at a higher risk of recurrence. The ideal situation would be for these patients at the time of their pre to urethra biopsy. Correct. And then that will give them the information that they don't have to wait for, you know, until the 11th hour. Um, but for 
if there's going to be an eye conduit where there's going to be no prostatic urethra remaining, then there is no reason for a frozen section. So we don't get requests for that. The only time we request are for bladders. And sometimes, in fact, at the last minute, the patient sometimes change their mind and say, no, I don't want, uh, uh, you know, a sort of a, a content version type of operation. And the frozen section is basically canceled the same morning to say, well, the patients changed their mind. So uh, to some extent, that is being used as more of a clinical preference rather than, you know, uh, solid science. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a clinical preference, communication with the patient. It's about, uh, you know, you get different uh, types of patients. And it's, yeah. yeah, I agree with you. It's not, the point is, it's not wonderful science. And for that reason, I think it's something that you should, we should try and discourage the surgeons by explaining to them the pitfalls with this. Okay, the, <clears throat> there's a couple, a little group of questions round about um, the application of uh, the, 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 the classification. The, the first one really uh, is around the definition of the status of the muscularis propria. Is it present? Is it not identified or is it indeterminate? And the questioner says that this is quite confusing to clinicians because they may interpret that this tumor is present rather than the presence of um, the muscularis propria in the specimen. So um, it's just about wording, I guess, and semantics. So um, can you address that one, please? Uh, yeah, Peter, I'm not sure that I've got the question exactly right. Well, so it, it's just, it's, it, the, if you mention, you know, the, the, the scoring or the, the grading system is about whether or not muscularis propria is present okay. or not. And yeah. you can't comment on it if it's not, but if you see it is, if it's present, there may be a misunderstanding that by saying the muscularis propria is present, you're saying that the tumor is engaging, is involved yeah. in that compartment. Okay. Yeah. So I think- and how uh, can we clarify yeah. that? Yeah. So I think as far as the one, the, the bit about indeterminate for, um, uh, uh, for that to the muscle, it's that you generally should reserve only when you've got a tumor involving that muscle. So you've got tumor involving smooth muscle and you're not sure whether this is muscularis mucosi, in which case you're talking about BCG treatment or whether this is muscularis propria, in which case you're talking about a cystectomy. You've got to make that, uh, you know, to convey that uncertainty to the clinician. Uh, in the, if you don't have any tumor involving that muscle, then it's only a question of is, I, have you identified that tumor or not? Because that is to let the clinician know how deep they've gone. Have they gone sufficiently deep in the TRBT? So it's an audit for their performance. From the clinical management, this has actually become less important. And the reason for that is the current clinical guidelines recommend that any patient with high grade T1 disease, uh, should undergo a re-resection irrespective of whether there's detrusor muscle in the TRBT or not. So even if there is detrusor muscle in the TRBT specimen, if the patient's got T1 disease, he's going to get a re-resection anyway. So whether you report it or you, whether absent or present, it's not going to change the management. Great. Um, <clears throat> we just need to begin to wind up. I'm afraid we're not going to get through all the questions, but there is also a question about reporting heterogeneity of tumors. And how do you actually do that when you've got a mixture of tumor types? Again, it's back to percentages and the relative weighting of these things. Yeah, I think it's again, uh, uh, it's all a very approximate. So what you're trying to do is, uh, again, the way I try to put this is, I think focus less on your percentage or the accuracy, but on your message. So what are you trying to convey to the clinician? that this is predominantly an ordinary uh, urothelial carcinoma with a little bit of squamous or a little bit of glandular, or it's a predominantly glandular or with a little bit of uh, urothelial. Or if it, now once you've got things like nested variant, micropapillary invasive, micropapillary variant, then whatever the percentage is, even a small percentage is clinically relevant for management. So these are, they are generally, that suggests because you're only giving an estimate. You're giving an estimate for two reasons, because this is, you know, it's an eyeball estimate. It's not scientific. So it's not as if you've done image analysis or anything. And secondly, you got the sampling error of the biopsy technique. So if you go and take deeper levels of your blocks or you submit a few more blocks, that percentage will change. So, so do a report, you're just giving an approximate idea to the clinician. 
Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Just before we finish, I, I, I punted a question at you a, a wee while ago about um, the, the, the incidence of yep. prostate cancers in bladder. Have we got a short answer to that? Uh, yes, it's simply that at that age group, uh, so uh, men at uh, about 50% of men uh, at the age of 60 have prostate cancer. Uh, if you look at autopsy studies, 80% of men at the age of 80 have prostate cancer. So prostate can incidental prostate cancer is like BPH. It's just part of aging. It's a normal prostate cancer is a normal part of aging. Now that's the incidental one. You got the other prostate cancer, the clinically significant high grade nasty disease. That's a different ball game altogether. But the ones we are talking about, these incidental ones, are small three plus three tumors. Okay, thank you. Well, I think um, we're going to have to pull this together and, and say thank you to everybody. But I, I, first of all, we'd like to apologise to the several questions that we haven't got round to addressing. And I guess what we can ask is that the panelists will respond to these um, if we can do. Um, if someone indicates to me whether this is feasible, if we can do that. Um, if, we, if they send their questions to us uh, at, at clinical effectiveness at rcpath.org, we'll be able to respond to them um, in due course. So I'm, my apologies for that. Again, some really interesting topics about the practicalities, but also about the issues and some of the, the fundamental processes going on in the reporting of these tumors. Um, interesting also talking about whose risks they are and what, what we think they are, and been some interesting comments about Lynch syndrome for example, going on through it and, and the other um, molecular markers. Um, a number of, of other topics we've not really covered, I guess, like uh, the, the issues of pdl one reporting um, and the relationship to platforms and how practical it is to do multiple tests. Um, but there's all sorts of really interesting stuff in this, this webinar. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to the panel, um, particularly uh, Murali for the, the presentation, but to Ash and Jonathan, who've contributed very well, and also to Lorna McWilliam, um, who was involved but hasn't been present um, at the presentation for other reasons. So thank you all for an absolutely excellent um, webinar. Uh, the, the next webinar in the series is on the 19th of May, and you're the first to know about this. It's not on the website yet. And it's about uh, the review of the data set for nasopharyngeal cancer reporting. And as I said, that will be on the 19th of May this year. And so finally, thank you again, and particularly to Cynthia, Georgia, Maria, and Chris from the college who facilitated and kept us all up to speed in the course of this presentation. Have a very, very good afternoon. Thank you all very much and goodbye.